Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to this Data Intermediaries uh, Launchpad event um, that is organized by My Data Global. Um, my name is uh, Silla Sepp. Uh, I serve as the program's lead at My Data Global, and uh, I will be your host uh, for, for this um, next coming uh, hour. Uh, but uh, before we move to the core agenda of today's webinar, um, I would like to also briefly introduce you uh, to you what my data is and why data intermediaries are uh, relevant for us. So uh, my data refers to the human centric approach to personal data, uh, which is in its core, the idea that uh, the person about whom different entities um, hold and use data should have meaningful ways to say how this data can be used, correct it if needed, revoke their permissions, etc. And this human-centric approach to personal data um, addresses many of the different challenges individuals, organizations, and, and societies as a whole uh, face today, and strives towards a more fair, sustainable, and prosperous digital society, which is also the mission of My Data Global. In such a society, uh, people get value uh, from their data and set the agenda on how it is used on the one hand, but on the other hand, also for organizations, ethical use of data is the most attractive option. And uh, my data has also defined um, three major shifts that need to, be, need to happen in order to start moving towards such a future. Firstly, becoming more actionable in the ways how we give individuals the power to manage data about them, uh, because formal rights uh, on its own um, are, are not enough. There needs to be also actual, actual practical uh, solutions that make these rights um, yeah, actionable and, and meaningful. Secondly, the second shift is empowering individuals with their data, um, providing them with services that uh, truly benefit them. And um, thirdly, ensuring that the services and data sharing ecosystems at large are always built with a principle to, um, to be open, where value creation would be accessible to, um, to many. Now, these shifts need support across different sectors and uh, need to manifest in practical developments in both business, legal, technical, um, and societal domains. And this is why we're uh, really glad to see Europe's investments in uh, regulatory initiatives, as well as actual infrastructures to uh, foster uh, realizing this vision and also natural uh, different stakeholders along the same path. And uh, my data was also recognized by the European data strategy um, to as one of the uh, movements uh, that promise concrete benefits to individuals as well as greater oversight and transparency over their personal data. And in that context, uh, we're uh, really glad to see also the role of data intermediaries, or as my data calls them, my data operators, uh, being recognized um, as uh, enablers of uh, trustworthy data sharing um, that helps foster this type of uh, human-centric uh, approach to personal data. Um, my data operators concept uh, was introduced already back in uh, 2014, actually in Finnish, um, and the next year right away in, uh, in English. But it was also uh, much more rooted into the my data thinking when the community defines it, uh, defined it, uh, its vision um, in the my data declaration, uh, where my data operators there were described as uh, one of the key roles needed uh, for human centric approach to personal data. And uh, while the operator landscape uh, has been rapidly developing, developing across uh, Europe and globally, um, there has been still uh, also little understanding actually on the offering of the different service providers, as well as how do they actually interact with each other and other stakeholders on an ecosystem level. And this started to get clearer uh, when my data published the um, understanding my data operators white paper and launched um, it, its my data operator award in 2020. Um, since then, uh, 30 companies have been awarded with the status of uh, my data operator 2020 and 2021 um, status. And um, now um, the, with the regulatory developments in the EU, particularly with the Data Governance Act, um, it's really important to also align the operator's work with the guidance coming from the EU. 
So um, to keep my introduction short, um, I'll stop here um, as we have two excellent uh, speakers here uh, with us uh, today um, to, share, to share light uh, with uh, or on the recent developments on the Data Governance Act and also complement this with the insights uh, gathered from, uh, from practice by studying the um, existing my data operators across Europe um, and also globally. Um, as I mentioned, my data global also um, ca carries out the award process for the operators um, for the already for the third time this year, so I will also sh share some key information about the words at the end of uh, today's event. Um, before I give uh, the, the word over to our presenters, uh, just a few uh, words also about the practicalities. Um, I hope you got there already the notification that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be also shared later on um, to all of the participants. Um, we encourage you to use the, the uh, chat function to add your comments throughout the presentations as, and questions as they arise. Um, and I will try to pick uh, um, up some of them also uh, after each presentation. If you'd like to also um, yeah, open the mic and uh, um, ask your question in at, uh, with voice and then just uh, raise your hand and I'll try to give them a uh, um, yeah, word uh, to you. Um, and you, in case you have any problems with some of the technicalities or any issues, then Demo will be monitoring the chat. Uh, so please uh, also reach out to them um, uh, to um, yeah, uh, try to solve it out uh, right away in the moment. But uh, then uh, I would uh, like to welcome on, uh, on our virtual stage uh, Malte, uh, Malte Bayer Katzenberger from the European Commission. Uh, Malte works as a policy officer and uh, uh, has had a really close look on the developments of the Data Governance Act. So I would uh, gladly welcome you on stage. Yeah, thank you, Silas. Thank you all. It's it's really a pleasure to be here. And I was just browsing through the participants list, and I'm glad to see some familiar faces because it's been quite a journey. And I see Benjamin André. I mean, I remember when we were visiting the Berlin Mall in 2015 uh, after the Franco-German summit. Obviously, I remember the workshop that we did in 2015 also in, in Brussels, already the first My Data gathering between Misanfo, France, and uh, My Data Finland, and uh, the a few operators uh, and a few initiatives that have been developing. So I've been following this space, I would say, since 2014, um, also because a, diff a number of operators have, have come to us and say, I have an idea how to reinvent basically the personal data economy. And here we are. So I tried to really, and I'm personally quite satisfied with the outcome, because in politics, you never know what you get. So you have to convince a number of politicians and a number of hierarchical people in an organization like mine uh, before things get into law. So I'm, I'm quite, quite, quite happy to be with you today. Let's look at the slides. I have brought a few slides and Sid is kindly helping me uh, with, with this today. I'm really grateful for that as well. Now, the Data Governance Act uh, is, is, a, is a proposal that we made in November 2020 and where we finished the political negotiations around the text in at the end of November 2021 um, and where we are currently now finalizing the draft. So the text is stable, it's been polished and you can expect it after translation to all the EU languages to be published and then actually entering into force around April and May uh, 2000 this year. Uh, you will see also in the text that there will be a date uh, that is given to everyone, including the public sector, to set up the authorities and also to the private actors who are concerned by the rules of 15 months to bring yourself into conformity with the rules. It's, it's really, I think, a global first in the sense of regulating intermediaries in the data economy. Uh, maybe many of you are familiar with the Open Data Institute's data access map, the archipelago type of uh, island looking map uh, with lots of initiatives of collaborations. And what we have attempted is with the Data Governance Act to, to get clear rules because we believe that the data economy needs intermediation services of some sorts and to fluidify uh, between supply and demand. Uh, overall, so we're not only covering my data operators, we're also looking at B2B services, uh, uh, data ecosystem services, data spaces services, 
so we were well we really tried to get to a new definition it was a hard piece of work so you see a lot of words to clarify what's a service what's not is a cloud is a service is an email a service is a browser a service lots of people came to us am i concerned am i not concerned it's it's and and we we still i think need to continue some of these conversations also so shiv i mean for the decentralized networks uh, it's also a good question who is actually then covered uh, if you are just offering the grid, so to say, but services happen on the grid, uh, who is actually meant? So there will be a lot of open questions and um, we're really also happy to have a deeper discussion with providers individually, if necessary, but also maybe in groups. So we can take a, a few questions that help everyone to be in compliance with this uh, new rules. I, I really, um, I think we're really global first on this one. So that's, that's I think, quite, quite important. Uh, and, and we're also quite proud, but pol politics is what it is. Windows of opportunity appear. And we were just lucky also to, to have had the, the political support of Thierry Breton and Margrethe Vestager, the two commissioners in the European Commission that, that oversee uh, my work, our work. Now, um, what's the, the key pieces are obviously that intermediation service play a very critical role. Uh, first, you can conceptualize them as being possibly the next type of platform, uh, the next type of thing that fluidifies everything. You can look at them as banks, as credit card companies. We can look at them as an underlying infrastructure that we all need, we citizens, we the data economy. Um, so you can look at it from many, many angles. Uh, and what we're trying is to really say they, they are so special that really also very special rules should apply to them and, and these rules are really neutrality and neutrality in the respect of i'm neutral vis-a-vis -vis what's happening on my marketplace i mean there are services that will one can app stores will be full of apps that want to use the data that i have in my personal data cloud but i should have no conflict of interest that's a, basically a preempting platform regulation if you want something that we're currently redressing on the other side with the digital markets act vis-a-vis -vis the mega platforms we're trying here to really say well for for certain players the, the, this kind of platformization effect should not even even come in the first place because then people also don't trust that's the second big thing people wouldn't trust another amazon another facebook service that basically sells them yeah you can store your data in this kind of space and then i'll take care of the rest uh, it has to be dedication towards this role and then it's also the absence and that's the third point the absence of conflicts of interest that's really something that always came back in the study phase yeah but wouldn't these people have an incentive for people to share more than they actually would like to do and how do you take it out and there were some difficult discussions i think in, in most of the member states this topic was completely blank but in some of the better informed countries they were also saying are we a bit too lax even with the data governance act because of this economic incentives couldn't ultimately only a solution that is basically state driven or is completely in a sense of a foundation that has no economic uh, uh, ambitions at all. Could that be the solution? And we'll see. I mean, many, many options are possible, but neutrality is really a key term and absence of conflicts of interest are the two key terms about the Data Governance Act. Just to say that in the study phase also, a lot of people said, well, it's nice to say I'm, I'm going to offer individuals to take care individually of their data. But Open Data Institute and a lot of others, the data union movement said uh, in many instances, it's also about collective decision making. It's about collective decision making, but it's also collective bargaining. So it's, it's always the two things. Together, you're stronger to negotiate with the big guys, but to get, together, you also may be more thoughtful on which data users are actually good for everyone, not just for the happy few or the digital natives or uh, or those with superior academic skills to just reflect on things, but to really see the repercussions of the data use across um, um, across communities. So also we have a, an option there to say communities can organize around data cooperatives, and that's what we brought here. I admit now in this crowd that it's not a very sharp regulation on what exactly we're doing with cooperatives. What well, I think the importance was to just bring it on the on the legal horizon to say this there is need for cooperatives, not only individuals, could also be farmers, uh, which so professionals if you want. And that we then see maybe also over time uh, how to further refine that legal framework. That's also a message maybe up front. I mean, this is not the last word. We have built in a relatively short review clause, which allows us after the next parliament election in the European Union to actually look at the framework and say, okay, we kind of overshoot it or we were 
not doing the right thing on this front or the other. Okay, let's look at uh, some of the details, maybe just for those who have never heard about Data Governance Act on the next slide. Um, this is just to get everyone on the same page what the definition actually is. And we reworked this definition once more in the final days, also with very informed colleagues on the parliament side. Now, the key words here are not so much is the service of a commercial non-commercial nature. That's also some people felt there were, could be loopholes because someone could give a, a service for free or on a basis on a non-commercial manner. But what ultimately matters is that someone has data an individual or a company and wants to get the data to something in return for money, a service, whatever it may mean, uh, or to just jointly also exploit a data pool because the pool size matters. And for machine learning, so many people have to have chipped in or companies have to have chipped in before the pool has a size for machine learning to actually be able to have. And this, so, so various services are possible, but what is important is that the nature of the data transaction is somewhat of an economic nature. We put the term commercial. I'm not fully happy about that choice because do individuals really have a commercial relationship? Think of commercial in the broadest sense of, of, of the word as an economic relationship, especially to delineate it with another chapter of the DGA, which is data altruism, so data donations, which is not regulated. So uh, if, if ever, ever an, a my data operator is really owned there for, for donating your data, for the, your data for the wider good, it would actually not be covered. But we believe that normally uh, a data wallet can host economically relevant use cases as well as also philanthropic or altruistic use cases. So what, what matters is that you are, as an intermediation service, managing economic relations of people. That's that's what we mean by the uh, the word commercial here. Um, next slide, please. And then come basically the, the neutrality requirements. I've already talked about you. It's There's a longer list in Article 12 on what you should do and what you should not do. We can discuss this maybe in the longer session uh, or when there's specific questions um, and when you maybe when you have seen the actual legal text uh, published. Next slide is maybe the one on the on the process. So what is the type of regime uh, that we, we, we think of in terms of bureaucracy and burden? Uh, it was quite important for us to make it light touch from a process point of view. So if you think you are covered by the definition I just projected, um, you are supposed to notify this to a competent authority. Uh, competent authority yet to be nominated at national level. So that's also part of the 15 months I spoke about in the beginning that member states have a 15 months period to set up the oversight mechanisms. And then also, well, communicate this in some form. And in case of doubt, we will know and we can share this in the community when the time has come, who is actually the contact point in each country, where to notify you to. And then what happens is that then this oversight body can come to you and say, uh, I need to know more. Normally, when we drew up the list of what you have to tell up front, we think it can be done in an afternoon, maybe in an hour even. There's some, some evidence you should say, so what exactly are you doing uh, that maybe you have to compile it and maybe polish it a little bit. But normally, it's really only asking for some fundamentals about your company, who you are, where you are established, and where you could be inspected if someone thinks they need to know more about you. But getting on the market, it should be really easy. Uh, in an afternoon, you should have completed that process. And then ex post, the, com the company authorities can come to you and say, okay, I need to know more. I think you are doing things with sensitive people's data. So I need to more know more about this requirement or that requirement. Uh, and some of the requirements also uh, need a bit of time, I think, to mature in terms of what is an appropriate level of cybersecurity. I mean, we left some relatively open words on, on, on some of these fronts. Uh, so also to not make it too prescriptive, but also to let it evolve over time. You will see that. So you notify and then you basically can, can offer the service that shouldn't be really much more than an afternoon's work to do it. Uh, and if you're coming from outside, uh, the union, you need to find someone to legally represent you in the union. That's a bit of a downside for, for those coming from, from outside, but that was politically important also for, for just for the oversight process to happen, because after all, services like these will transit at least uh, sensitive people's data. So we felt 
it was good to have a, a compliance system that already also works. So no certification, none of this. Uh, you just go with your thing. And then over time, we will see whether that system also, also work. OK, maybe one additional slide on this, or I move to a, a second topic I wanted to quickly raise here. Uh, now, we have spoken about data in the mediation service. Um, and thanks for the many great questions popping in every sentence I utter almost triggers a question. So next time we'll, we'll plan for a longer session to, to have all of this. I wanted to just uh, maybe see also the place of data, of the my data operators, of the personal data intermediation services in the wider spectrum of the common European data spaces. I gave you a little tentative definition of my own, what is actually this data spaces, what they are. There's not something mystical around it. It's more like a stable data collaboration setting in among an open number of businesses and maybe eventually also individuals uh, to, to collaborate on a, on, on a set of agreed standards. And you know that Gaia X has, has some of this uh, in the pipeline. The commission will fund some of this. But the, the really big open question is how would actually individuals participate in the data spaces? And if you can just quickly jump to the next slide, which I inserted five minutes before the call. No, it didn't work out. Um, so I'll, I'll try to, yeah, this one. How did you make that, Scylla? You're great. Uh, I, I fiddle in this one um, just to tell you how improvised things still sometimes are. So this is a slide deck I sometimes use when I speak about the common European data spaces. And you see a bit like how we, how I attached personally, actually, uh, this little thing on the bottom saying personal data spaces, which is just like something is just randomly placed there. I mean, everyone with graphic skills knows this is not a very uh, nicely done uh, slide deck. Um, and, and the question really is, I mean, what, is that the right place? It should be inside, should it be embedded in any of these kind of uh, vertically coming down arrow thingies? Uh, and, and that's the big uh, thinking thing I would, would invite the MyData team also to see. How do you, would you position a MyData operator across all these data spaces? Health is one that concerns people. Mobility concerns people. Finance can potentially concern uh, people. And then skills, obviously, in public administration. So the individual is in some of these, not, not all of them, maybe, you know, manufacturing of, in, of things. Uh, but in energy, he will be, you know, and she is as well. And, and, Agriculture, maybe less. So, where, what is, what is the, what, how do we embed the notion of my data operators? That's my question to, to the community, and, and to the core team more specifically in the architecture of the common European data spaces. And I think there's still some conceptual work to do. As you know, a lot of these data spaces design comes from industry, from manufacturing industry, uh, where there's data sharing needs that are being designed. So this is uh, maybe a second, we can go back to the original slide deck. This is a little call to, to you all to, to also think about what role my data uh, uh, operators should have. And that's that's my talk. Thanks a lot. Now I see tons of questions in the chat. Indeed. Thank you, Malte. Um, I will try to pick some of them up. Unfortunately, I think I, uh, we won't be able to cover all of them, but uh, hopefully you can also then continue um, responding to uh, to some of the questions in the in the chat so um i'll start from the point uh, that uh, or question that violetta uh, brought up um who is a valid legal representative for organizations um outside the eu um, yeah i have no good answer to you here um what it but many enterprises have experienced that what it needs to be able to do is that it can receive uh, any letter from an oversight authority can be serviced also court orders in case something goes wrong. So it needs to be empowered and mandated uh, duly to, to do legal business for you in Europe. That's what the role is. And I'm not sure whether there's a service industry actually to do this possibly. Um, I, I'll note this down and we can maybe another time if it's when do a dedicated session maybe for, for those concerned how to appoint a legally valid legal representative. But I don't think there's a, an awful magic to it. It's more that you have to find a law firm or someone who, who, who is willing to receive letters for you and uh, maybe even represent you then in court if or with, with the authorities. And it's, it's an interface established in the union. So we have no, no trouble to servicing court orders in in, in Singapore or wherever it may be, Australia. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Um, then Yogi asked, uh, what was the reason to put the term uh, commercial there and, uh, for example, also in exclude offering data intermediation uh, for the purpose of public sector services? Um, no, the, the specific use of commercial is, is actually an, a bit of a drafting accident. Some people had a preference for this, and then we said, okay, let's let's go with this. I mean, this was a complicated definition on many, many fronts because we had to look at a lot of services that excluded. But what matters for us is that the services play a role in the economic life of people and companies and also get a, a, a view on the economic behavior of you as a consumer or of companies. And that's why only their kind of economically relevant relations should be should, should matter because th that brings the risks of market surveillance of seeing who's doing business with whom which consumers normally do this or do that and that there you should have this neutrality requirement so it's more, it's more from that point of view we say when 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 we are speaking commercials it gets sensitive because people are then having incentives to attack you to sell you things or give information to competitors Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's also it, it back to the question now if I mean I see Paul also I mean I, I know that there's great work going on in Flanders around the solid protocol. Uh, any use and then we also had this great discussion with Vivi and the city of Helsinki, any use case which is purely citizen to government uh, or the other way around is actually not covered. So if a, if a government at any level builds data services for its citizens like a my citizen account kind of thing, it, it's not covered. We also wanted to keep those out of the, the regulatory burden. When the citizens account, which is still a question I have for Flanders, uh, could actually be the data utility company, now I'm speaking, uh, could become a kind of a service that potentially competes with, let's say, Cozy Cloud or DGME in Flanders. I mean, then it would be unfair if they just because they come from the government and they maybe have a first use case being a government use case that would be unfair to say you guys don't have to respect all the rules that are inflicted on cozy cloud and all the others so a bit of level playing field uh, where these government driven cases then broaden up to a wider economic life of citizens so whereas it may be desirable that we have maybe only one data wallet uh and maybe, uh, maybe also the question with the eid wallet um uh, kill that question and the same way maybe we have an eid wallet which is probably government sponsored or government funded because the the neighboring colleagues thought they should now responsibilize the government and say you guys have to make sure that everyone has a wallet and then then they took a second choice which i personally did not really we haven't taken say well and we will not leave it to the market and just certify those people who feel qualified but we will say no no the government issues the eid as it, it, it issued passports and driving licenses but as also the examples that sometimes these colleagues give go beyond government issued documents or some more certificates they sometimes wander then into other areas of verified credentials i sometimes wonder about the interplay that's something which is not really super clear uh and where the colleagues would say well you can have a data wallet yet, like you have a, a wallet for your boarding passes and your train tickets uh alongside the eid that is um, but sometimes I wonder whether EID may also have an impact on the space in which my data operators can actually get traction. And, and so I'm personally not specifically happy, but that's what happens in large organizations, different policy strands, not only, not always match where they should meet. Indeed. Um, I'll take one more question uh, that Robert asked uh, about uh, the consequences uh, if uh, one doesn't actually comply with, uh, for example, for uh, uh, for notification, then uh, what happens? Is yeah, there, is, there are some some sanction rules. I mean, first, uh, normally you would be given time to to rectify and to comply with the, the advice of the competent authorities, but you can also be fined. It's not a very, I would say, refined and prescriptive system here. This is something we will, I think, gradually develop also. Uh, with the member states to say, okay, what's appropriate? We, we really, I mean, maybe for you, it's 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 clear. But I mean, in the preparation of this, I mean, ninety five percent of the people I spoke to never had heard about this. For them, it was completely Neuland, as they say in German, uh, completely a novel 
chart. I had no idea what these services looked like. The data protection board and the data protection supervisor in their learn and opinion had no clue what they were talking about. It was very obvious. So just getting it right on what is the object was the hardest part. And this is so defining sanctions. It'll happen once we see also more services coming. And I, that's also I mean, why I like to follow this community, just to see what are the type of services we're looking at and how do they evolve? What's the service proposition that works with people? Uh, and whether where I had some ideas, I mean, based on the, the study phase, but at some point I also, we stopped maybe also following uh, business models. So that's also where the regime is maybe sometimes not sufficiently precise, also because it needs to grow. Uh, with with time, so I wouldn't be too worried. So there's a lot of uh, awareness uh, raising needed as uh, as well across different different stakeholders. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of uh, time a little bit. Uh, so I'd ask you to actually, um, if, you, if you can, also to um, uh, answer some of the, the questions in the chat. But I, I noticed also I, that you, uh, you've been uh, um, raising your hand uh, from the start. So was there anything that you'd like to comment on? Uh, um, or was that? Person can I off? take another question before for that because it's an important one and I want to make some advertisement and it shifts question on data portability. I think the one on the DMA article 61H is very important, uh, but I also want to advertise that we're working on the data act and the data act has one key feature it's all the smart connected objects that you are bound to buy in the next coming 10 years, and we will probably come for with a portability right from all these smart things next to the online services where there was a choice to focus on few gatekeepers like the big mega platforms not on everyone so also expect more data to flow because that we're, we're not going quite there where, you know, where yogi wants us to go with the government okay sorry i wanted to make that point no worries. Thank you for making it. And thank you for, for your presentation as well. So let's move on with our uh, next uh, presentation. And uh, I'll welcome Antti Yogi Boykola uh, on our virtual stage now. Uh, Antti is uh, uh, the vice chair of MyData Global and uh, also one of the lead editors for the Understanding MyData Operators uh, white paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is under renovation or refreshment, uh, um, if uh, I can say it like that. Um, and uh, Yogi will be able to share with us the key insights coming uh, from the operator's work that uh, we've learned um, in the recent months and years. So please, Yogi. Okay, thanks. Uh, great to be here and uh, really good questions in the chat uh, for Malte. And actually, I would hope may that maybe Silla or someone, if you could pick pick the questions and we can, can see if there is a possibility to also get some short answers in written format. I, I'm not pushing Malt to do that, but if that's possible. Anyways, um, let's move on. Uh, I, I cover quickly the basics of what the My Data operators are actually. So uh, if you can move the slide. So uh, Silla already uh, showed earlier uh, the historical timeline. So uh, the timeline that was written from the perspective of uh, my data, the movement, what we are here uh, part of, but the idea of uh, intermediaries uh, or trusted intermediaries, that's much more uh, older. So uh, even this is probably not a full literacy list, but it starts from the end of 1990s, where there was idea uh, before the dot-com boom uh, of uh, making this kind of interfaces between people and organizations in internet. And that idea have uh, evolved uh, and revolved over and over uh, many times. And uh, it's also a question of uh, technological capabilities when, when the time is. Uh, but now, maybe 20 years later, we are now for the first time in a situation when uh, these kind of uh, intermediaries are actually uh, becoming regulated. Okay, there are some related types of regulations in other jurisdictions, but uh, this is very much dedicated to data intermediaries, what is coming from the European Commission. And uh, there was also the My Data Operators paper that was published uh, back in 2014. And in this, my presentation, I tried to uh, put in context uh, My Data Operators with the data intermediaries in the uh, Data Governance Act 
what is common and what is perhaps different. So if you move on. So uh, this is the image from my data declaration, by the way, if you haven't signed uh, that one yet, you can go mydata.org-declaration. Uh, that was the paper that uh, was foundational for my data global the association, uh, where we uh, laid out the principles for human centric personal data management. And we also recognized in that uh, declaration, uh, the different possible roles in personal data ecosystems. Maybe there could be uh, other views on this, but this is a uh, melted down view of uh, quite many experts in the field uh, by that time. And uh, uh, we saw that there is a, a potential for uh, operators that are uh, facilitating or intermediating, as the word is now, uh, the data flows between data sources and data using services uh, so that they follow uh, the or for the benefit of the people. And obviously this kind of operator service that can do a lot for the person or maybe even against the person if that's not the good type of operator. So it's kind of really a honeypot uh, location for making the data economy work for the people, but also unfortunately against the people if that's not working right. And, and that's why we claim this uh, terminology that um, we want these my data operators to, uh, we want them to make, uh, make reality. We want these kind of uh, opportunities to be, but we want to make them right. So that has been the starting point for the uh, idea of developing my data operators conceptually and now also practically with the um, community of 30 uh, awarded my data operators. So we, uh, uh, underlined very heavily uh, the human centricity, how to make sure that in the end of the days that will be for the good of the people. And then what we undermine, uh, underline also very much is the interoperability. So we don't want to be in the situation where there is uh, one giant global my data operator that everybody is forced to use. So go on, please. So the idea is that currently the situation is that uh, personal data is pretty much managed in within the organizations. Uh, uh, so the same organization collects the data, it manages it and it uses it, of course, manages in the uh, under regulations, for example, GDPR, but still it's uh, managed by the organization and integrating data from multiple sources is, is very hard. Uh, and in the future, if you move on, the idea is that um, uh, data can be collected in one place, managed uh, by the people uh, and used and reused in several places. And, and when I say managed by the people, that's probably not super interesting for most of the people. I'm, I'm not like eagerly going like, yay, I can manage my data. So I can spend hours and hours in day to manage my data. So uh, I'm kind of careful with that wording, uh, but it's really moving the locus of control for the people and how that is done. It should be uh, easy and understandable and, and technologically facilitated so that it's not kind of uh, uh, very hard management, but really moving the locus of control. That's the key point. And uh, there should be, uh, in order to this happen, there should be specialized services for different parts in the value chain. If you move on, please. Uh, this creates uh, then the idea of um, personal data ecosystems or perhaps the data spaces, which is the terminology now in, in Europe. Uh, so basically these settings where the data can be flowing be, uh, between the different uh, parties, data sources, data using services and uh, uh, under the per permission or consent of uh, people for the good of the people. And in this kind of ecosystems, uh, the role of the my data operators would be to offer uh, this infrastructure and facilitate the data flows so that it's uh, really for the good of the people. And when I underline and repeat the, for the good of the people, it's not kind of antagonistic that it should be for the bad of the organizations. So uh, we see it very much uh, so that win-win uh, situation that the organizations uh, should be uh, benefiting as well uh, when the data is managed uh, for the good of the people. So kind of balancing it, uh, bringing the people to, to the equation uh, but not trying to wash out the organization from the equation. So it's kind of either or situation. 
And uh, the key is that there are now in this image, uh, there are two operators, but it's just to depict that uh, equally like we have uh, phone operators or banks, we have network of operators. So we don't force everybody to use the same phone operator. If I get your phone number, I can call to you and the call magically uh, is connected and each and every party of the uh, transaction is happy, including the operators, they have their rooming uh, rules and, and uh, can make business out of it. So uh, in the same way, we see that there should be interoperable my data operators that uh, uh, create a network where different people, data sources and data using services can connect uh, for uh, making it uh, possible to share the data in, in trusted and governed manner. If you move on, please. So um, this is uh, then from the idea that okay this looks good let's try to figure out how it uh, would be possible in reality so we can look at of course from different perspectives from the business models from the uh, legal side uh, but this is now the technical view uh, that we uh, wrote in the my data operators white paper back in 2020 it's a, a reference model for uh, the things that many or most of the uh, my data operators uh, do. So it's not like everybody needs to uh, do each and every one of the box in the same way. Uh, but most of these things are very much common to, to any uh, data intermediaries. And now actually I, I uh, just checked back to the um, uh, reference architecture or, or design principles for the common European data spaces, which is not specific for personal data. And uh, when I saw the uh, architecture picture there, uh, it pretty much had the same or equivalent uh, parts. So these are nine parts here. So I'm not going to go in any of the details here. Uh, you can read the white paper and, and if you are more on the technical side and interested, you can are very much welcome to join the My Data Operator community to learn more. Uh, the thing is that if you move on, uh, that this reference model was there to create, uh, or the white paper and the reference model was there to create a common language for the existing organizations that are doing these personal data intermediation. Uh, and uh, if you move on, uh, this uh, we we wanted to make this interoperability happen, uh, and we wanted to make this organization to uh, strive, drive for human centricity. And in order to de do this, in the beginning there was no thing like data intermediary clearly defined or my data operator clearly defined so um, so we created uh, this my data operator award process uh, that let these organizations self describe describe what are they actually doing and we have been running that now for two years and today we'll launch for the third uh, year and here are the logos of the uh, awarded operators so far uh, moving on please so uh, I put here side by side, and this is actually very much uh, uh, the same what was already asked in the questions uh, when Malte had his turn. So uh, Data Governance Act is what we are speaking now. And for the My Data Operator, it means that My Data Operators uh, that are working in EU will be in the scope of Data Governance Act and will need to comply with the requirements. Then the data spaces. Uh, so what is the role of the my data operators or data intermediaries uh, as, as a whole in the data spaces? Uh, I put here that some data spaces will benefit from data, my data intermediary, intermediary, data intermediaries such as my data operators to uh, provide infrastructure. Uh, there are probably some other kinds of data spaces settings which are more kind of point to point, which do not perhaps uh, require uh, intermediaries in the, uh, the sense of uh, data governance act, but that's kind of something that we need to really study on and see how it turns. But I would believe that uh, uh, these data intermediaries, including my data operators, will have a big role, especially in the interoperability between the different data spaces. And then the European digital identity, uh, that's a key piece of uh, uh, soft infrastructure coming to Europe and that's another kind of question mark. How does that actually fit into the same picture? So 
obviously we need to somehow identify the uh, different stakeholders in data transactions, the data sources, data using services, and the people. Uh, and perhaps this EIDAS uh, 2.0 could have a role there. Hopefully it is open enough so that it's not kind of becoming separate island of its own. Moving on, uh, and also trying to be careful with the timing, uh, so I'm not going to cover this uh, uh, at all. Uh, uh, so this is the Data Governance Act article uh, for the conditions for providing data intermediation services. So the, these are the requirements that the data, uh, my data operators and other data intermediaries need to follow if they are wanting to do business in Europe. And uh, obviously compared to the uh, my data operators current mode of self-description, saying that okay we do this and that and that uh, now we get the regulation that actually uh, sets clear uh, limits what has to be done and what cannot be done so this will be a step uh, forward in also building the common language and interoperability and there are two uh, i think there are 16 uh, requirements altogether and two of those i highlighted uh, with special notes, so there is the uh, uh, interoperability with other intermediation services uh, that's required and then acting uh, in the data subjects best interest when facilitating exercise of their rights, that's another one. So the human centricity and interoperability is are both embedded in the requirements of the Article 11. Moving on. Uh, this is the uh, article about uh, interoperability. I just copied it, uh, a hard copy, uh, hopefully from the latest version of the DGA text. Uh, so the provider of data interme intermediation services shall take appropriate measures to ensure interoperability with other intermediation services, among others by means of commonly used open standards in the sector in which the data intermediation service provide, uh, provider operates. So uh, as Malte said, this is fairly open, I mean, what is appropriate measures that need, uh, that will be defined at some point by the authorities uh, and uh, uh, I think my data operator community uh, has something to say there. We are developing the interoperability uh, from bottom up and uh, maybe uh, hopefully also kind of setting the standard at some point that what is needed and this is moving target what it appropriate measures today uh, on 2022 uh, should be different what is appropriate measures in three years when move things has developed uh, uh, further so that's my opinion that it should not be static uh, moving on uh, I'm getting close to my uh, end point so uh, now we know that we have my data operators uh, and we have data intermediaries. Uh, my data oper operator is a human centric data intermediary and data intermediaries can exist also in other parts of the world, not under the EU jurisdictions, uh, but if they are going to work in the EU, they will be uh, under the Data Governance Act. And in the act, there is also uh, mentioned that um, uh, the commission uh, or, or the uh, recognized uh, data intermediaries can use the wording provider of intermediation services recognized in the union and there will be also a kind of logo this is not the official logo i just copied some eu star thing from the internet but uh, there is a, a commission can develop this kind of logo with the delegated act later on and moving on so uh this makes me and us, the community, to think what is the role of my data operator award if there is also kind of official uh, labeling uh, for these data intermediaries. So uh, I see it in, in simplified version in, in three parts. So there will be my data operators uh, as they are today, the full yellow circle. So uh, today they, there is the self-description uh, model uh, and it's not focused only in, in EU. Uh, also in the future, there will be my data operators outside of EU and perhaps uh, we will split then the operator so that there is a kind of lightweight approach uh, for those who don't need to or don't want to comply with the EU uh, regulations are not going to do business in EU so they could continue more or less with the same self-description model. Of course, that will evolve also over time 
uh, but then in the uh, middle section, the overlapping part with the, um, uh, so those MyData operators that will be operating in the EU, uh, they will be also DGA compliant and we will uh, create then the MyData operator uh, process so that it uh, facilitates these operators to also uh, fill the requirements by the, uh, from the authorities in the EU. And we have this transition period, uh, 15 months plus time also to, to get, uh, get uh, up to speed and, and match with, with the needs uh, from the authorities. So probably there will be then a kind of a higher gear of my data operator mark uh, that is uh, then with, uh, with EU compliant. It's, it will be probably a heavier process, hopefully not too heavy. We don't want to exclude small organizations, but still if there are 16 uh, clear criteria, we need to be able to assess that these criteria are filled. And then there are uh, other EU data intermediaries that are not uh, dealing with personal data or in unfortunate cases might be dealing with uh, personal data but do not want to do it in human-centric manner or, <laughs> uh, or so that uh, they would be outside of the my data operator scope but still in the scope of the EU, uh, EU data intermediaries. And moving on, so uh, for this, uh, this was uh, like uh, speedy, speedy discussion of uh, everything that <laughs> I had uh, had at the mo moment. But I, I leave a couple of questions here in the end, and uh, these are really open questions. I think nobody has real answers to these yet. Uh, so we will see how many and what kinds of organizations seek to be recognized as data intermediaries in EU. Hopefully the law is not going to be paper tiger. So hopefully there will be uh, uh, traction and actual organizations that uh, uh, fall in the scope and it, it, uh, it's a real thing. But how many, if it's hundreds or tens or thousands, and if they are big or small, or will they be mostly in Europe or outside and, and what kinds of organization? That's really, really interesting to see. And uh, then other thing is how uh, the authorities will be interpreting the conditions in the Article 11 and how harmoniously I've been told that it will be probably a little bit of Wild West in the beginning since there is no nothing else than the law. But then the Data Innovation Board is, is uh, tasked to develop this kind of uh, harmonized uh, uh, guidelines for the authorities as well. So how fast it moves and whether that interpretation part will be strict or loose and where it should land, that needs to be seen. And the how, the, the especially how the interoperability condition will be enforced, that's that's really interesting uh, question. Uh, and uh, how fast uh, we are pushing for real interoperability and so forth. Uh, then the question relating to data spaces is that how prominent role of the data intermediaries will have in the data spaces. Of course, the other question is that how prominent role the data spaces will have overall. But uh, assuming that there will be data spaces in Europe that will do actual real business and data transactions are uh, growing and flowing. So will the data intermediaries be a critical part of the, that kind of infrastructure uh, like, or like minor part there? We don't know. Uh, and then the uh, question of EID regulation, how the identity wallet infrastructure fits to the data intermediary and data spaces development. Really interesting to see. And what is the DTA influence in the international development? We know that in, in some other places, like in Japan, for example, there are similar kind of developments and uh, probably uh, other countries will be looking to Europe to see how this works. So that's my and I think I took a little bit over time, so sorry for that. No, uh, thanks a lot for really important questions, uh, really uh, good insights uh, from the operator um, scene landscape. And, uh, and yeah, looking forward to collaborate with all of you uh, in the audience as well to uh, start answering those, uh, those questions. Um, unfortunately, we are uh, a bit tight with time, so if you have questions to Yogi, I would ask uh, all of you to write in the chat and ask Yogi to respond uh, there um, and use the, the last few minutes to also quickly um, introduce uh, to you the Mided Operator Awards um, 2022 that are coming up again this year and uh, runs for the third time um, in a row. 
So um, my data operator awards uh, recognizes, uh, yeah, organi organizations that have shown uh, leadership in this uh, personal data space through their approach to be uh, human centric and focus on empowering individuals uh, with the tools that, that the, they need to manage their uh, personal data. Um, as operators are providers of human-centric infrastructure for data sharing and management, um, then the scope of the award is nevertheless uh, um, the for services providing um, yeah, such functionalities and such infrastructure. Um, this is very much a celeb celebratory uh, or celebratory um, act um, that aims to highlight uh, leaders in this space on the one hand, and on the other hand, as, as also mentioned and discussed earlier, um, help understand the landscape of data intermediation services uh, better. Um, service providers that want to apply and uh, need to nevertheless, um, yeah, share some information about uh, their offering. Um, firstly, uh, demonstrate also alignment with the MyData principles uh, by, by signing the MyData declaration and becoming uh, a member of MyData Global. Um, then describing the general operator activity, the position in the ecosystem and, and typical use cases. Um, show that the operator um, satisfies um, yeah, the criteria of transparency um, and, and clarifies how the actual service provider um, empowers um, individuals with, uh, with their offering. Um, fourthly, um, yeah, describe the, the systems of personal data management with the respect to uh, my data operator's reference model. Yogi showed the, the image with nine different functional elements. Um, and uh, clarify also the standards and technologies um, used and um, um, actual services to provide these functionalities. And um, if service providers offer or intend to offer um, their services in the EU, then we ask you to also show alignment with the Data Governance Act requirements. Uh, which we nevertheless um, keep private. That means that individual answers uh, uh, won't be shared publicly, um, but uh, we use these to make sense of the operator's um, readiness to comply with the requ requirements and also help, um, the uh, help to support um, you and, and the other service providers along the way with, uh, with relevant advocacy from, from our end. And in short, uh, the word helps you stand out in the sector uh, to both uh, partners as well as individuals and other users. Get ahead of uh, the curve on, on new legislation and standards by collaborating with other operator services and the thematic group. Get an edge uh, when bidding for contracts that, as it shows your leadership in this uh, space. But also, and, uh, and really importantly, join the growing my data movement of ethical personal data companies. Um, this was, uh, um, here you can see all, all the 30 companies um, who have re received the word uh, in 2020 uh, and 2021, and uh, we hope to de definitely increase this group of operator services. So if you feel um, that uh, your um, company or organization provides such services or know somebody else, uh, then uh, please encourage them also to um, apply for this operator award and, and uh, join this group uh, of uh, yeah, operator services. Um, the application round um, is um, open until 10th of February, um, and then there will be different steps regarding getting feedback to the application and also peer calls, um, uh, that, uh, and then the awards will be announced on the 16th of March. Um, there will be also a detailed schedule and more information uh, on my data website, mydata.org slash award. And uh, yeah, finally, um, it's uh, really important uh, to just uh, reach out um, uh, to us if you have any questions about the award and, um, and uh, yeah, join, join this group. So um, how to apply quickly and uh, there is a dedicated um, uh, application platform uh, you can make the um, your account by registering right away uh, start uh, your entry and there's uh, you can uh, save it in progress so always come back and and um, start uh, from where you left off in the in the last moment um, and then submit it uh, by the deadline um, as i mentioned there will be also this uh, uh, the 
uh, the, the period where, where there is uh, peer review and peer uh, calls uh, running, um, and these are aiming really to, to co-learn from each other's uh, oper uh, services um, network and also try to improve each other applications. So uh, maybe the community as a whole and also operators are very... Um, yeah, there's it's 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 based on on peer support and and this have shown also um, has been proven to be valuable to the uh, operator services. After making any improvements, you can uh, then uh, and we ask you to resubmit it uh, for final review. And if all uh, criteria for the award are met, then we will uh, issue you with the operator award. And it's time to celebrate. So um, if you have any questions, please reach out and um, um, already try out uh, uh, the uh, creating an account and see how the application looks like. And, and uh, we'll look forward uh, hearing uh, from you um, if you're interested in, in, the, in applying for the award. Um, unfortunately, I see that the time has passed already our deadline for, for this event, um, so if there are any questions, I'll try to also pick them up quickly in the, in the chat, um, but otherwise I'll already say a quick uh, thank you from on behalf of all of us uh, presenting here today um, and, and joining us here today to, um, to, for taking this time uh, to join and uh, yeah. Join the My Data Slack workspace to continue these discussions with the community, as well as uh, yeah, reach out via the uh, emails if that serves best. Thank you all. <laughs>